where's the pastor? Oh, I'm going to hurt myself. I didn't wear a helmet. I didn't wear a helmet. Check this out. Whoa. Check out my pink scooter. I'm man enough to ride a pink kitty scooter. I'm not talented enough, but I am man enough. Anybody ever have a scooter like this? Yeah? Know any good tricks? Ooh. Whoa. Here, I'm going to do a trick. You ready, Al? Here we go. I'm just kidding. <laughs> not going to do that. So this, this scooter is not real large. Probably, uh, probably could walk faster than scootering around. And how far do you think I could go on a scooter like this? Like in a, in a day? Around the church? I'm already winded and I went like five feet. But if I was in shape, I think, I, you know, maybe I could get a mile or two, maybe a little bit more in in a day. But boy, would I be tired. And I think the sole of at least one of my shoes would probably be worn out. But what if there was something better? What if there was more? Hold that thought. (laughs) Aren't you glad you belong to a fun church? We had to put a deposit down on this one. This thing's super quick. You thought I was coming for you, didn't you? He trusted me. You've been my favorite all along. Check out this. Don't you like these scooters? I think around town they're called bird scooters. You got to pay for them. Whoa. Don't worry, Eric. If I break it, my wife will pay for it. Oh. Boy, that's fun. Can I get this back to you in like in a week and a half? I just need it to go around the halls of the church. (sighs) Are you as winded as I am? You wouldn't think riding the electric one would. Yeah, it's fun. I got to get me three of those. So this morning we're talking about being a spirit-empowered church. If you've been with us, We're in our series called We Are the Church. I encourage you to get the podcast or go on our YouTube and watch the videos if you haven't been with us. We have talked about, as a church, we are, these are kind of our vision or value statements, I would say, uh, of being a life-giving church. So our vision statement is we exist to build life-giving churches that lead people to find and follow Jesus. And so these are these statements that we've been studying over the last few weeks really are about the values, the behaviors that we see as a life-giving church. So we're gospel-centered, we're community-minded, we're compassion-driven, we're next-generation-focused, we're disciple-makers. And last week we talked about being servant leaders, and this week we're going to talk about being spirit-empowered. You know, there's only so far I could go with this scooter, being self-powered, right? It, Even if it was a little bit bigger, it wasn't like made for five-year-olds. I can only go so far on on self-powered. And many people in their Christian life try to do the Christian life by self-powered. If I just do enough stuff, if I think the right things, right? And all those, those things are good. You should do the right things as a Christian. You should believe the right things. But ultimately, what makes the Christian life possible is being spirit-empowered. It's having an external power source that can be charged up at any moment, at any given time, without running out. I could charge this thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, right? Can I just preach from this? Would that be? <laughs> that's, what, that's what being spirit empowered means. It's not that we make less effort in living the Christian life. I've met many Christians who are like, oh, I'm saved. I got the Holy Spirit. I'm good. I don't really have to make, a, I don't have to make an effort. No, it's that our effort now is coupled with the power of the Holy Spirit that makes the life we were trying to live on our own possible. 
As I read the scripture, I'm not just thinking, how do I do that? I am thinking that. But by the power of the Spirit inspiring me and the power of the Holy Spirit in and through me, I'm actually able to walk that out. I'm able to do it. We are spirit empowered. Our value phrase says this, God's spirit empowers us. Our success as a church is determined by our dependence on God's spirit. Our success is determined by our dependence on God's spirit. There's something as a pastor, when, whether I was a youth pastor or when I became lead pastor, there was something that, that I knew that I wanted as far as our church and the people I was pastoring. I wanted to be, the defining thing that people knew us for was the presence of God. Now, unbelieving people won't say those words. They won't be like, you know what? They had the spirit of God about them. Unbelieving non-church people, those outside of faith, don't use those phrases, but they'll use phrases like this. There's something different about that person. They were so kind and generous, and I don't know why. I don't know why those people came to my neighborhood to serve me. I don't know why they gave so that I could have this. I don't deserve it. There's something different about those people. That's the defining thing for me as a pastor, as I think about being a spirit-empowered church. The scripture that I was thinking of is Exodus chapter 33, where the people of Israel have, have fled from Egypt. The Lord led them out, brought them into freedom, led them to Mount Sinai, where he gives them the Ten Commandments, the law. He says, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people. They make a covenant, and they say, we'll do everything that you've commanded us, right? Obligating themselves as the Jewish people to the entirety of the Torah, the law. And now they're about to depart Mount Sinai. And Moses is kind of having this moment like, okay, is this, is this it? There's got to be more, because we're You're telling us to leave. And Moses says to God, I'm a little worried. Those are are my words. And the Lord replied, uh, so Moses says, I want to know you and I want to know your ways and I don't want to leave this place because you've revealed yourself to me here. So in verse 14 of Exodus 33, the Lord replied, my presence, everybody everybody say presence, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Verse 15, then Moses said to him, if your presence, everybody say presence, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? You see, living a Christian life is not simply about being a good person. There's a lot of good people that, are, that don't believe in Jesus. They do a lot of good things. They get kindness and compassion and generosity, sometimes better than Christians do, unfortunately. And Moses says, don't send us up out of this place unless your presence goes with us because it's that thing that will distinguish us from everybody else. It's the one thing that makes us different is the presence that your presence would be with us. That's what will celebrate, that will separate us is your dwelling presence, Lord. That same presence we describe as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is that presence, that abiding presence that is with us. It's the presence that was promised in the Old Testament that shows up again in the New Testament. Now, the Holy Spirit is not a New Testament invention. Many people reading the New Testament will look at it and go, oh, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit shows up for the first time. No, he's been a character all along. He's been in the story since the beginning. The Holy Spirit, when we, we talk about the Holy Spirit, you may ask yourself, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the third person, the first, a third revealed person of the Trinity of the Godhead. So that's a lot of theological words right there. So let's unpack that just a little bit. The third revealed person. So if we say that's the third, that means there's the first and second. Very good, class. God the Father, God the Son, revealed in Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. 
the abiding presence of God with us. Jesus is the physical representation of God. The Holy Spirit is the spiritual representation of God to us. So that's what we call the Trinity. It might be a word that you haven't heard or might only hear within uh, the context of the church or the matrix, but you got the matrix. Thank you. You're welcome. That's how old we are. Some of you are like, what's the matrix? Ask your parents. So the Holy Spirit, he doesn't show up in the New Testament as a, as a addition or new, new addition to the team. He's been there since the beginning, as was Jesus in creation. The Holy Spirit was there hovering above the waters of creation, revealed throughout the Old Testament through signs and wonders. If you think about the story of the Exodus and what led the children of Israel through the desert, if you've, if you've read that story, there's a cloud of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day to lead them. It's a it's the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a, a sign of the Holy Spirit. And there's all these moments throughout the Old Testament. And then we get to the New Testament. And here's where Jesus gives some inklings about the role that the Holy Spirit will have in the life of the believer is the promise of the dwelling presence of God. And in Acts chapter one, verse four, it says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, that being Jesus, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. He's speaking about the Holy Spirit. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Again, in Luke chapter three, verse 16, it says that John the, the Baptist answered the people and says, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, right? So there's this picture and there's this promise of the Holy Spirit, the abiding presence of God, something that we as humans can perceive with our spiritual sense and with our physical sense. How many of you had a moment where you go, I know I sensed the presence of God? You might say something like that. I felt it. I mean, there's all these sort of Christian words that we attach to it, but we might say, I felt it, I experienced it, I perceived it, right? So the Holy Spirit of God can be perceived by both our physical senses, but mostly by our spiritual sense. That sense that for most of us isn't always very in tune. It it doesn't recognize the Holy Spirit sometimes. The role of the Holy Spirit, let's talk about that real quick. What, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? The role of the Holy Spirit is to make the life that pleases God possible. It makes all the things that God wants for us and in us, it makes them possible. Now, if, if our goal was to get to space, like Elon Musk it doesn't matter how powered up my scooter is. I am not going to get to space with this. I'm sorry. Elon's terrific and all, but it's not going to get me there, right? I'm going to need something greater. And the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer in fullness or what, what John referred to as a baptism, a covering, this is the power that is needed to live the Christian life. If I want to get to space, I'm never going to get there on a scooter. I'm going to need something that's greater than that. And so God, the Father, knowing what he wants for us, knew that in our own power, we could never get to where he wanted us to be. And so as a good father, he didn't leave us to our own devices and say, okay, do your best with, what, with, the, with the scooters of your own making. He gave us the Holy Spirit to get us to where he wants us to be. You see, the Holy Spirit is involved in salvation, right? When we talk about the Holy Spirit, it's not, some people have this idea that you get saved and then you get the Holy Spirit. But 
part of the process of salvation, when you come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, it's actually the Holy Spirit who's at work within you, convicting you of your sin and showing you your need of Jesus. Without the grace of God the Father and the action of the Holy Spirit, we would never know our need to repent, right? We would never know we were wrong. Have you ever been in that moment where you thought you were right, but you were wrong? Husbands? Once I thought I was wrong, but I was mistaken. I've been waiting all morning to say that one. I'm so sorry. So the Holy Spirit was involved in salvation. Um, this, I, I'm going to put the scriptures up there. You can write them down. I won't have time to read all of them. But Titus chapter 3 tells a, 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 us of the process where we are away from God. The Holy Spirit in, in our weakness comes to us revealing our sin. He saves us, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus did. He washes us, gives us new birth and new life through his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then teaches us, John chapter 14 Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. He he will teach you all things. As you read the scriptures, he will show you all truth. The Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, showing us how we ought to live, what we ought to do. The Holy Spirit lives within us, Romans chapter eight, verse 11. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us, Romans 15, verse 16. Sanctification, or the word sanctify, means to make holy, that God is in the process of making us more and more holy or making us more and more like him, more and more like Jesus. Philippians chapter two, verse 13 says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So it is actually by God's divine action upon us by his Holy Spirit that we actually want to do what he wants us to do. As we were singing that song this morning and we're, we're making that our prayer, Lord, I want more of you. I'm hungry for you. I'm thirsty for you. It's that type of prayer of surrender that you're giving permission for God to come and to place his will inside of you so that you want the things that he wants, that you want to do the things he wants you to do. And trust me, God wants to do in you the things, uh, the great, greater things than maybe you want him to do in you. But as you make that your prayer, Lord, I want you to sanctify me. I want you to put your will and to help me act in order to fulfill your good purpose. That's what sanctification does. It's the process by which we are becoming more and more like Jesus. And one day you'll be perfect. Do you know which day that is? the day you die. In that moment, when you cross from this life into the next, the Bible says, it is then you will put on perfection and you will know what perfection is. In sanctification, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you're given power over sin and temptation. I don't know if you've ever experienced this moment where there's something that, we're okay. There's something that you know you ought not to do but you just want to do it, right? Those of you who have been around children, you, you've seen temptation uh, work itself out in a kid. If you watch them close enough and you say to them, hey, don't do this, what do they want to do? They want to do that thing. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit when you're looking at your life and you're saying, I don't want to do these things, especially those of you caught up in addictive habits, caught up in a, a, in, in a, a, a pattern of pain and you just can't get over it, where you can't, get, you can't get over some sort of grief or offense and it just constantly causes you uh, problems in your life. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that can help you overcome. I'm just going to kick that out of the way. <laughs> It's the power of the Holy Spirit working in you that is able to help you overcome that which you cannot do on your own. The Holy Spirit also opens our spiritual eyes. As much as you have 
physical senses, you also have spiritual senses. And so we use the phrase spiritual eyes as a metaphor for being able to see in the spiritual. You could say spiritual ears, spiritual heart, spiritual mind. All these things are kind of caught up in that, that phrase that when the Holy Spirit comes in your life, especially in the fullness of the baptism, your mind is changed. The way you see things changes. The way you perceive things changes. Finally, the Holy Spirit empowers us to be a witness. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus says, go and wait, right? He says, you will be my witnesses, right? The power of the Holy Spirit's gonna come on you and you're gonna be my witnesses. So this is the role of the Holy Spirit in each believer's life. So I hope you were taking notes. Um, I do wanna say this. Today's message is not gonna be all encompassing. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to speed through some, some critical things to help you just on a basic level understand. But in January, January is gonna, uh, our sermon series is gonna be all about the Holy Spirit. So if you, if you this morning are like, gosh, this is really big. I'm not sure I understand all this. Stick with us. Make sure you come back in January, 2023. Just take that in for a moment. All right. I believe that God is, even now, in, in January, going to meet some of you right where you're at in a special way. And this is what I've been praying all along. We're planning this series. I think it's going to be fantastic. I don't want you to miss it. Anyway, we'll keep moving. So if, if you have questions beyond today, one, talk to your small group leader. Two, reach out to us. Three, make sure you get into our series in January. So I want to talk a little bit about what a spirit-empowered church looks like. We're not going to unpack everything about the Holy Spirit today, but I am going to unpack some things that I feel like as a church that being a a Spirit-empowered church looks like. And the first one is this. A Spirit-empowered church is biblically grounded. Biblically grounded. Sometimes Pentecostalism gets a bad rap for being uh, all about the spontaneous, all about whatever you feel in the moment about really crazy things. And here's what I want to say. Pentecostalism, which I grew up in, fourth generation Assemblies of God, Pentecostal preacher. Being a Pentecostal means we're even more so biblically grounded. Right? When you are spirit-empowered, it's really hard to be spirit-empowered when you are, are not biblically connected. This is where you get churches that do all sorts of things that, are, that aren't connected to the Bible in any way. And we pass it off as, well, they're spirit-led. It's, it's sort of like we use the, the, the word uh, Holy Spirit or spirit-led as a guise to excuse all sorts of weird behavior. I heard when I was growing up, they're like, oh, yeah, there's this whole movement up north in Canada, which, I mean, if they say Canada, I'm already sort, sort of suspicious. I'm from Minnesota. And it's like, oh, people were barking. And and there was this great move of the spirit and people were barking and making animal sounds. I'm like, where's that in scripture? Show show me in the Bible where that is. I'm not saying it wouldn't be possible. I just don't see it in scripture. And and I'm I'm Pentecostal and grounded in scripture. So that's where I go. I, I go to the Bible to get my cues on how I should act and behave. And so a spirit-empowered church must first be biblically grounded. When we talk about being biblically grounded, I want you to understand the power of the scripture. Because I sometimes think people think of the Holy Spirit as this more powerful being than the word of God. But they're not. The word of God was revealed in the person of Jesus Christ who John called the word of God. And so the Bible is correct when in Hebrews chapter four, it says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of, division of soul and spirit and of joints of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I believe that the Bible is the perfect, inspired, infallible word of God that has authority in my life and in yours as a believer. It is the words by which the Holy Spirit will speak to us. If you're a person who's like, I've never heard the Holy Spirit speak to me audibly. And maybe you've heard Christians say things like, well, I heard the Holy Spirit say, or I felt the Spirit say to me. 
I always will say this. If someone says to me, well, I felt like the Holy Spirit said this to me. I'm going to say, does the Bible confirm it? Does it conflict with the Bible in any way? Now you have to remember, when the New Testament was written, there was no New Testament. So the scriptures for the apostles was the Old Testament. So everything was filtered through the Old Testament. Everything was filtered through that. That's how they determined if they were following God, if they were becoming Christ-like, was if they were following that which was written in their scriptures, that's what they used. We have the advantage of being able to see through the New Testament that becomes our filter, that gives us example. It helps us interpret what the Old Testament means to you and to me. It's difficult to be spirit-led and biblically illiterate. Can I say that and just offend you a little bit? The thing I see in scripture is when Peter has this moment on the day of Pentecost, we'll talk about that in a little bit moment, but some of you know what I'm talking about. He didn't make anything up. He didn't just come up with some new ideas. What did he do? When he stood up in front of this crowd of Jews from all over the world, He said, this is that. And what he did in that moment was he began to interpret the Old Testament scriptures through the lens of who Jesus is and what Jesus had accomplished. And he said, this is what was promised. This is what the prophet Joel spoke of. This is that. He immediately turned to scripture to interpret what was happening in that moment on the day of Pentecost, known as the Feast of Shavuot, a Jewish feast started at Mount Sinai. Pentecost wasn't a New Testament invention. It dates all the way back to the Old Testament in Exodus. So when we say things like, I feel, have you ever said, I feel like the Holy Spirit is leading me to do this? I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying that? That's not a wrong thing to say. I say it all the time. But we have to be careful that we don't let our feelings lead us in the wrong direction. It's important that what we feel lines up with scripture. Now, there are times where I feel something and I, I'm not sure that scripture actually speaks to it. So you know what I do? I'll go to trusted people who are wise. I say, hey, I, f- I feel like the Holy Spirit might be leading me to do this in my life, right? Like some of the things that we do nowadays, the scripture may not talk about at all. I feel like I... I, I might want to marry this girl. Well, the scripture talks about marriage, that it's a good thing, you should, but it also talks about being single. So now I'm confused, what do I do, right? So this is where we seek the wisdom of God. Not only from scripture, but from other people. And I I would go to trusted people and say, hey, here's what's going on in my life. Would you pray with me? How many of you go to other people, other Christians, other spirit-empowered believers and say, hey, would you pray with me about this thing? Because I want to make sure what I'm doing is biblically grounded. I'm not just making things up. And sometimes then you take that step of faith with uncertainty, right? Some people talk about when they take steps of faith or being a person of faith, they confuse that with being a person of certainty. Do you get the difference? Being a person of faith is not being a person of certainty. There's a lot of times in my life that I take the step of faith without being certain. In fact, that's why it's called faith. Because I don't know. But I do trust that I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I think God's leading me, and sometimes I've got to take that step. So we're biblically grounded. Second, I believe being a spirit-empowered church means we're prayer-dependent. We're prayer-dependent. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. Acts 6, 4 says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. If we're going to be spirit-empowered, and I would use the word spirit-led sort of synonymously, we've got to be people of prayer, discerning what it is God is saying. So I'm pouring myself into Scripture. It's pouring itself into me. And I'm, then I'm praying and I'm asking God, give me a spiritual mind to understand what you are saying to me, how I should behave, act, think, the decisions I should make. Galatians chapter five says, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. There's this idea of constant motion, right? As a church and as a believer, 
that God is constant, constantly leading me, right? His ultimate goal is to make me look like Jesus. The way I behave, the way I act, my attitudes, my thoughts would all ref- be a reflection of who Jesus is, right? That's the ultimate goal. And so being a person of prayer, someone who's dependent on prayer, it's the thing that connects me to the heart of God. Jesus said in John that if I don't abide in him, I can't do anything, right? Right. I I, I could be the self-powered scooter and try to make it along, but I need to stay connected, plugged in by abiding, and prayer is the way we abide. Third thing I see is a spirit-empowered church. We are mission-focused, mission-focused. So we've talked about the mission of our church. We exist to build life-giving churches, and that, that all stems from the great commission that Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 8 to go make disciples, to go out in all the world and make disciples. So we're mission focused. The mission of God throughout all of time was to have a people that would be his very own. When he chose the people of Israel, well, at first he chose Abraham, then he chose the people of Israel, and he said, I'm choosing you and I'm gonna bless you so that you might be a blessing to all the nations that the nations might know. Sometimes I think as Christians, we're content with our salvation. We're like, hey, good, I get to go to heaven, I'm good. See you when I die. And yet the work of God is so much more than that. He wants to work in and through us to bless all people, that all people might know who he is because of us. We are mission focused. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus says these words prior to his ascension to to his throne in heaven. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There's an empowerment, we've said, an empowerment that comes with the Holy Spirit that comes with a responsibility. It's power for a purpose. Christians aren't given the power of the Holy Spirit so they can get together on Sunday mornings and feel good about themselves. This is important. Our gathering is important. But what that power was meant to do was to push us out of this place and take the gospel of Jesus to the whole world to make disciples. I think the questions we need to ask if we're mission focused are these. And it's somewhat reflected in in our value statements. Are we servant leaders? Do we give generously? Are we discipling others? Are we reaching the lost? Are we participating in church planting and multiplication? All those phrases are about mission focused. That's what being spirit empowered means. We are mission focused. We're not experience focused. Sometimes the church, and I would say the Pentecostalism I kind of grew up in, was all about an experience. You just chased the next experience. And if it was happening somewhere across town, you went over there. And then if it was happening in Florida, you went there. And then if it was in Toronto, you went there. Because it was about me experiencing something. But true Pentecostalism is about the world experiencing something and the world hearing about the hope in Jesus Christ. And finally, I believe a spirit-empowered church is community-changing. It's community changing. Look what happens in Acts chapter two when the, communities of, uh, the community of Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit begin to walk and it says in verse 41, those who accepted, this was Peter's message after the day of Pentecost, they were baptized, they were immersed in water and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The work that was happening inside this new community of Jesus not only changed those who were in it, but it began to flow outward and began to change the community they lived in. It changed from a few disciples into a movement. Here's what I know about the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is what in the military they call a force multiplier. Anybody know what a force multiplier is? It's the thing that will give you the advantage against a force that is equal in, in number and size. So if you, you might think of World War II, a force multiplier for us was the atomic weapon. Once we developed that and used it, game over. It didn't matter how many soldiers or boats or tanks we had, that was a force multiplier. If you are a ground soldier in the infantry, a force multiplier would be having air support, having airplanes and jets and helicopters to drop bombs and help you out and do the things you can't do. This is what the Holy Spirit does for the church and for the believer. He does the things that you cannot do on your own. He's a force multiplier. And I think a church that is spirit empowered has the force multiplier of the Holy Spirit begins to make an impact in their community that they otherwise could not make. And here's the thing we have to ask ourselves as a church. If the community around us is cha- isn't changing, what difference are we making then? Should we be here? So I think the community that we live in should be changing. It should be changed because we are here. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Twice Jesus mentions this power of the Holy Spirit. In Greek, it's dunamis. It's sort of where we get our word dynamite. It's, it's, it's this multiplied power that works from the inside out. If you look at what happens in Acts chapter two in the, in the first verses, They had obeyed Jesus' instructions. And can I say, that's the first thing you've got to focus in on in this verse is that they listened to what Jesus said. They didn't try to go do something. They went and waited for the power that they were were promised to receive. And says, when the day of Pentecost, Shavuot came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind, very reminiscent of Mount Sinai, came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages that they hadn't learned as the Spirit enabled them. And the miraculous thing that happens is Jews from all over the world are hearing these Judean Jews speak in languages that they shouldn't have known. There was this miraculous speech. And here's what I want to say. We're not going to focus in on it a whole lot, but some of you may have grown up in a church that was all about speaking in tongues. It is a true supernatural phenomenon that's grounded in scripture. Some of you might have grown up in churches where like, oh, those people speak in tongues. They're weird. We're all weird. <laughs> oh, that's, that's not... That's not of God. It actually is of God. It very much is so. It's in the Bible. And it's a pattern. If you read through Acts, I challenge you, read through Acts and see every time that the Holy Spirit makes makes himself known in the book of Acts, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and then something else follows. Does anybody know what that phrase is that happens to follow every time it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit? And they spoke in other tongues every time. So there's this pattern. We'll talk about that more in January. But what my point is, a spirit-empowered church and a spirit-empowered believer has a supernatural speech available to them. If you believe that God does miracles and can control the most unruly member or muscle of your body, does anybody know what the Bible says is your most unruly? Your tongue. So if the Lord wants to get a hold of you, maybe it's in the very place that most of us stumble the most in our speech what if God wants to supernaturally inspire your speech so your prayer and your worship are more powerful when you pray you're praying the very will of God have you ever had that moment when you pray and you're just like I don't know any more words in English I only know one one language anyway I barely know that that's funny but when I pray in the spirit suddenly I'm praying the very will of God because it's being inspired by the Holy Spirit So you have an empowered speech. I would say you have a a spirit-inspired speech. When you see Peter in the book of Acts, there in chapter two, when he stands up to address this crowd that has now gathered upon this manifestation, he is inspired in his native tongue to speak to the people. 
Sometimes you are gonna face a situation where you don't know what to say. And how many of you know the Holy Spirit in that moment can give you the exact words? You ever had that happen? Where you just don't know what to say, but somehow you find yourself saying the right words that are needed to say in that moment. I would say there's a spirit-reminded speech too. As you read the scriptures, as they become part of you, when you're in a crisis, God will bring those things to your memory. He'll bring those words back to, to your mind. Luke chapter 12, when Jesus is warning his disciples of persecution, he says, don't worry about what you're gonna say. I will remind you. I will remind you of everything. You don't need to worry. I'll remind you of what to say. So here's what I teach my kids, and this is how I pray for my kids and my students. When you take a test, here's how I pray for them. Lord, remind them of everything they studied and do not remind them of anything they didn't study, right? I don't believe you should pray that the Lord will give you supernatural insight to things you did not be faithful, you were not faithful to study on your own. It's the same with the scripture. God can't remind you of something you didn't put into your mind in the first place. (laughs) Remind. <laughs> he's not going to just mind you. He's going to remind you. So put the scripture in your head so God can bring it to you in the moment that you need it. Empowered speech, empowered gifts. I can go through Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, and Romans 12. It talks about the supernatural spiritual gifts that come upon every believer in the church. It's not for some believers. It's for all believers. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, it says about these gifts that each is given for the common good of the church. And then it says, I'll have to look through here. It says that these are given to the leadership to equip the saints. That's you guys. Everybody raise their hand and say, I'm a saint. Not a New Orleans saint. I just want to be very clear about that. You are a saint. And so these gifts are for you. It says the job of the pastor and the leadership is to equip you to do the ministry. To be a kingdom of priests, as Deborah spoke about earlier. I am not the only, I am not a priest. Or I understand that pastors are not modern day Old Testament priests. That, that's not what I am. I'm a member of this church empowered by a particular gift called pastoral leadership. And that's just one gift. We need all the other gifts. Right? We see in this new community empowered minds that see their work as worship, that see that their finances are a way of providing for the work of God. They have insight and discernment into situations that previously they did not. They have empowered actions with courage and boldness. When Peter is faced with circumstances, he doesn't know what to do. It says the spirit of God empowers him whether it was miracles in the moment or the right words. Have you, are, are you tired of living that Christian walk where you are constantly thinking, I'm, I don't know what to do? Have you ever asked yourself, is there more? I believe there is more. I believe that the empowered believer begins to see those things, generosity, love, unity, all these things that come out in the last part of Acts chapter two, verses 42 through the end, talks about this community that's loving one another and united. And these people had nothing in common, especially in that day. They should have been divided, much like our our culture. Oh, you don't look like that? You don't dress like that? You don't have politics like that? You don't have this? Oh, we, we can't be friends. But the empowered church brings people together who are united. How do we become that church? Number one, prioritize prayer and scripture. Prioritize prayer and scripture. In your life as a believer, prioritize prayer and scripture. Prioritize prayer and scripture. When you do this, 1 Corinthians 2 says, you will have the mind of Christ you will begin to think the thoughts that Jesus has about situations, circumstances, people. How do I deal with that person at work? I don't know, study scripture, pray, put yourself in connection with the Holy Spirit and he'll begin to tell you how to treat, how to act, what to say to that person at work. Second thing, practice the presence of God. What does that mean? Practice the presence of God. To me, this means you surround yourself with people and places 
that bring you closer to God. You practice the presence of God. You make yourself think, God is with me. God is with me. There is something magical that happens in every classroom. Uh, if you've ever been, uh, been like this, in fourth grade, my fourth grade teacher, his name was Mr. Fosberg. We called him Mr. Fozzie Bear. He would step out of the room. And you know what that means when the teacher leaves the room. <laughs> and he would always say, I want you to act as if I was still here. If we had a substitute and he knew he was going to be gone for something, he'd say, I want you to treat her like you would treat me. And we, we did. When he would leave the room, sometimes we'd hear the intercom where, you know, the intercom could listen. Tricky, tricky. Never mind. Okay, I'll keep moving. So when you practice the presence of God, you act as if God is with you. Most of the time, we act as if God isn't with us. But what if you changed your thinking and every moment you felt lonely, you felt anxious, you didn't know what to do, you stopped and said, I'm going to practice the presence of God. I'm going to act as if. I'm going to act as if God is with me. I'm going to act as if he is for me, not against me. I'm going to act as if he's already got an answer and I just got to listen and I got to wait for it. I'm going to act as if the scriptures are true. And I'm going to act as if I do what God says. He will protect me, provide for me and do everything that I need. Can you act as if? Practice the presence of God. Finally, surrender through obedience. Surrender, surrender through obedience. Listen, God doesn't bless disobedient people. He can't. I don't care how much you speak in tongues or you do all these other spiritual things. If you're disobedient to scripture, if you're mean to people, if you use your words incorrectly, it doesn't matter. Surrender through obedience. I think some of us... And the reason we feel disconnected to God is because we've reserved parts of our life. And we say, well, God, you can, you can have my eternity. Like I want to go to heaven, but I really don't want any, I don't really want you to do anything in my life while I'm living on this earth. <laughs> you just heard that and you just went, oh yeah, that's me. God wants to change your life now. And the only way he can do that is through surrender. You have to say to him, you're king, not me. You're Abba Father, you know best, not me. Only through surrender. And if you walk by the Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit, you'll be led by the Spirit. So we're gonna take a moment right now as the band comes, just our last few minutes together. I don't, I don't want you to focus on anything else. I just want to, in this moment, to practice the presence of God and invite the Holy Spirit of God into this moment. I'm not asking for anything weird. This isn't a moment, in fact, I, I don't think this is a moment for any sort of prophetic words right now. I think this is a moment of reflection because I, I know there are people here who, one, need to repent. That's the first step towards walking in line with the Spirit of God is to repent to turn around from going what you, where you think you need to go and start going the way God wants you to go, doing it his way. I think there are those who need to just simply receive from God. I think some of you might be at that point where you do need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit to walk in the power of God in your life. I think there are those who God wants to reveal something to you. And the only way you're gonna hear that is if you're just still, you listen and you reflect in this moment. I think there are those of you who are struggling for an answer even today, right now. And God wants to reveal something. I don't know if he'll reveal the whole thing, all the answer. He might just reveal the next step. And you know, sometimes if God reveals the next step, that's just enough. That's all I need. I just need the next step. I don't need all of it. And I think for some of you, it is just a moment to rest in the spirit. Can we do that right now as the band sings a song? We sing, let's just welcome the Holy Spirit into this moment. If you want to stand, you want to stay seated, whatever you want to do in this moment. I think the best thing any believer can do in this moment, in every moment, is to receive all that God has for them. That's one of the things I've taught people over the years and it, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, about being filled with God's Spirit. It is the, the prayer I make that I pray on a regular basis is, Lord, I want everything that you have for me. I think some of you have maybe some baggage or thoughts about the baptism or the, the filling of the Holy Spirit. And I just want you to put those aside for a moment. And over the next, I would say over the next 30 days, 
60 days as we head into our Holy Spirit series in January, I want you to study the book of Acts. And I want you to study all that God does in that book of Acts. And I just want you to ask God and pray this prayer. God, whatever's from you and it's real, I want that in my life. If you have more, I want that. Whatever's of you, I want, I want all of it. I want all that you have for me. And that's the prayer that I've encouraged people to pray. And over and over again, they have told me they have experienced the fullness of God, the filling of God's spirit in their life. I think every one of us need to receive that spirit from God in a new way today. So would you make that your prayer with me? And I'm gonna lift my hands because I think that's, you know, I don't know, I feel like this is like a big cup and I'm like asking God to fill it up. But I put my hands like this. This is clearly a sign of receiving, right? And this is a sign of good defense on football. So this, that's how I'm gonna do it. Because I just, I need my body to respond, respond to what my, my mind and my spirit are praying. So would you do that with me this morning? Father, in the name of Jesus, we wanna receive all that you have for us. We surrendered a, a Sunday morning because we wanted, we wanted more of you. We wanted to celebrate your community that you brought through your death and resurrection. We surrender all of our thoughts and our ambitions to that of yours. We want your will and your way to be evident in our life. We want the spirit of Christ, the fruit of that spirit to be evident to everybody who sees us. And Lord, we're desperate for your spirit. We're desperate for your abiding presence that makes us different than all the other people in this world, people who are without hope, who are just as good as we are. And I, I don't want to be just a good person. I want to be supernatural. I, I want to be all that you've created me, me to be. I want to live the purpose that you have for my life. So would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Would you fill me from on high? Would you clothe me with that power that you promised in the book of Acts? Lord, I believe that your promises are true. I believe that when you said it, you meant it, and you'll do it. I believe that I don't have to be good enough, that I just repent and I say, God, I want to do it your way, and I believe you want me to do it more than I want me to do it. And I believe you'll give me your spirit so that I'm empowered to do it in a way that I could never do it on my own. Would you do that this morning to every heart that is seeking, to every soul that's hungry, to every soul that's thirsty, that's tired and weary, that needs a touch from you, that needs more from you. And you promise that you would fill those who are hungry. We would never hunger and thirst for anything else again. Would you do that this morning? That's our prayer. And Lord, don't let it end this morning. Don't let it end in this moment. Don't let us walk out with a warm fuzzy and then leave it at that. But God, do a transforming work that radically changes our desires, our behavior, our thoughts, our intentions, our words, our speech. Lord, everything. We want to be a spirit-empowered church that reflects your kingdom. So it's in the mighty name of Christ that I pray. It's in the mighty name of Christ that I ask all this for your people and for your glory. In Jesus' name.